I think you're all uh, getting better and better, singing higher and higher. <clears throat> praise the Lord. Wonderful song. Great to praise the Lord together. And now let's get into the Word of God a little bit and see what He has for us in our, our setting this morning, our second service. Good morning, everyone. Doing okay? Ready to go? Join me in Luke chapter number 16 and uh, let's study the Word of God together and see what He would have for us in His Word. And, uh, many of you have already partaken of a, a little bit of a, a lesson, maybe Bible study already. Many of you have not, so uh, may the Lord talk with you personally. I hope and pray that um, what you're here for in this moment, in this time, is truly uh, most of all for the Lord, second of all for you, and that He will receive your attention, your honor, and the glory that He deserves as we break in and teach the Word of God. Again, we have a time of singing and, and praying already, and a lot of people, they come to church and say, give me a good Bible message, and if it's no good, I'm out the door. Well, that may be partly the fault of the speaker. In my case, it's 100% my fault. But, but on the other side of it, a lot of times it's our own fault that maybe we haven't come uh, in the proper heart and the proper attitude. So uh, let's, uh, let's see what the Lord has for us as we get into Luke chapter number 16. We've uh, just spent the last couple of weeks looking at 15 and um, the series of little parables that really is one big parable of Jesus Christ speaking about something that was lost, something that was found, and the joy and the rejoicing that came with it. And uh, we went, if you went even further back, and you went to Luke chapter number 14, which we were at for a little bit, and there was uh, some great teaching there from Jesus. Uh, each one of the audiences, though, was a little bit different. Just like this morning, you are uh, the audience in and of the Lord, and there is an audience that is in the setting of Scripture in Luke's Gospel. Uh, beginning of Luke 14, we know that he went to a Pharisee's house to have a meal, and then Jesus Christ, after that, broke into teaching and interaction and froze them a couple of times. They didn't even answer some of his questions, and it went further on to him teaching about an invitation that he has for people to come to this great meal, and how people rejected that invitation. And so Jesus, again, teaching through much, having an audience of Pharisees and some, uh, some scribes. Oftentimes, you start with chapter number 15, the beginning of it talks about publicans and sinners and how the Pharisees criticized him for having an audience and a teaching time with the publicans and the sinners, the tax collectors that were really turning against their own people to work for the government to be able to take the taxes of the Jews. And, and so Jesus Christ takes criticism, though, just about every time when it comes to the Pharisees, when it comes to the scribes. And so here we are, at the beginning of chapter number 16, you figure out that there is, again, a, um, the disciples that he's going to be speaking to, and the disciples are going to get his undivided attention. But the Pharisees are going to show up again. And today we're going to talk about something that is intertwined in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Of course, Luke's Gospel contains so many parables, and this is regarded as a parable, though the introductory words by Luke, the author, don't say that it's a parable, but we look at it as a parable. Uh, but we'll go into the second half of this chapter next week, and look at really a real life story of how there is this rich man and this sinner and how Jesus Christ reveals the hearts of the audience by speaking over their hearts toward God. But today, it's about stewardship. Now, we have had some different messages about stewardship. If you went back to Luke chapter number 12, there's something about being a faithful steward and that's included there. There's 
much teaching. There's other parables about the talents out of Matthew 25. There's also, of course, a similar passage in uh, Luke chapter number 19. So Jesus speaks a lot about stewardship. What does it mean to be a steward, to be a caretaker, to manage over and oversee someone else's property and possessions? Now, I would say that in the audience, I know many, many, many of you personally, to say, I'm born again. I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I called on the name of the Lord to save me at some time in my life. I can remember there was a time and a place uh, where I just said, I, I realize that my belief system's messed up. I believe in my own self-righteousness. I don't think anybody can save my soul or forgive me. So someone opened up the scriptures and said, for by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But, but, but no, I see that passage of scripture that says there's none righteous, no, not one. You're right. For the wages of sin is death, gift of God is eternal life. Ah, I, I, I can relate to those. All of sin and come short of the glory of God, sign me up. But the scriptures teach by God's grace that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by him. So you, all of you in here that, hey, I know that. I saw it in scripture. Someone showed it to me, and I called out to Jesus to save me. I asked him to forgive me. I turned from my way, and I went to his way. That's simply a change of mind. It's repentance. So you say, okay, got all that, pastor. Duh. You are a steward of that salvation now. Do you know that? Say, sure, I know that. What's a steward? You're to care for something that is someone else's possession while it is in your possession. Your salvation is God's salvation. And he gave it to you through his son, his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ constantly was telling him, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. But when you call on the name of the Lord, he's talking to people that had to repent of their belief system and turn to Jesus and Jesus alone. And so when you do that, you know what? At that moment of new life, you became a steward, a caretaker, a property owner of the salvation that you possess in Jesus Christ. Every one of us as believers, followers, disciples, you and I are stewards. You say, so why do I need another stewardship lesson? Well, it's just what Jesus is showing us in Luke's gospel. And today we're going to talk about the unjust steward. The steward who didn't do things well. And as often we see in scripture, especially in a parable, parable style teaching, Jesus just gets right into it. And that's what I love about some of the teaching of Jesus is just bam. And what we find is this steward failed. He did something that you and I do sometimes, maybe more times than we like. So I use this terminology around here in our, my leadership style, and I've learned it over the years from people much wiser than me. But one of the ways in which I talk to some of our men in, in ministry and some of them as a, as a shepherd, I said one of the ingredients that will make you successful is that you learn to manage it failure well. So that's the title of our message about stewardship today, manage failure well. If a steward manages the affairs of another and they fail, what do you do? Just kick them out? No. Manage through the failure. You say, oh, they just need to be chastised, beaten, <laughs> just <laughs> hang them out to dry. Manage that failure. Look in your own self and decide that through this idea that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, the synoptic gospels, that 16 out of Jesus' 29 parables deal with a person and stewardship and money. And it is said that one out of every, now I didn't do this during my study this week, I just, I copied it, copied it this note from someone I respect a great deal is a Bible teacher for 30 plus years who says, one out of every six verses in Matthew, Mark, and Luke deals with a person's stewardship. So 16 out of 29 parables that Jesus taught 
are about money and a person in stewardship. And one out of six verses in those synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Luke has one out of six verses talks about stewardship. I guess it must be pretty important. This could be said that it's an actual event, but I would look at it as a parable today. And here we see again one of Luke's contrasting parables. Not necessarily a comparative, but a contrast. So let's learn today from this scripture how to manage failure well. To me, some of the greatest success stories are over people that learned to manage failure well. I would say this, being a major league anything, high-level sport athlete, high-level business owner, high-level teacher in a classroom, uh, a, a, little, uh, a teacher in a little uh, Sunday school room with children, you manage the failures that you end up executing in people's lives as much as you manage the failure of others. What do nurses and doctors do all the time? They manage failure. Can you imagine if they didn't imagine, uh, manage it? They would just send you right out the door. I'm coming to the ER. We're not managing your sickness today. We just don't feel like it. We're not in the mood to manage what you did to yourself. What, you think it's my fault that I'm 100 pounds overweight? No, it's, it's the food's fault. It somehow finds a way into my stomach. I don't know. Can't you now take care of that? No, no, no. They decided not to manage my failure. You see, medical personnel, educational personnel, homes, moms and dads, you manage the failure of your children well, and if you manage it well, you'll be a better steward than if you managed it not so well. Join me for scripture reading. Luke chapter number 16, verse 1, will cover 18 verses as it says up on the slide. Jesus speaking, and he said un also unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. See, Jesus is right in it. Here's the subject. There is a rich man who's the owner. There's a steward that works for him, and he's been accused of wasting his goods. What does he say in verse 2? And he called him, and he said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship. Again, remember what stewardship is. It's caring for the possessions, property, monies of someone else. You're going to administrate over it. You're going to care for it. This is what his life is. For thou mayest no longer steward. Can you imagine? Here's your warning. You cannot, by the way, I'm firing you, but I want an accounting of what you've been doing over the last few weeks, months, and years. Verse number three. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg I am ashamed. <laughs> I can't be with one of those common people that I lord over and I steward over. There's no way that I'm going to go dig a ditch or beg. What am I going to do? Verse 4 tells us this is a man of action. I am resolved what to do that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. Who's they? It is the people he's been doing business with, representing the owner, the rich man, going to do business for him, with them, to be able to make the owner money, the rich man, but also he is to make money too. He's working off a commission. Deal? You got it now. You know where we're at. This is stewardship. This is caring for something. This is a background of it. Verse number five. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first. If he says every one of his Lord's debtors, that means it's going to be a, a pretty big batch, but he just picks out two. He says to the first, how much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, a hundred measure of oil, measures of oil. To me, this would be very simple. I, I think it is anyway. Not may, maybe, maybe it's lamp oil. I think it's olive oil. I would say that it's a product that they probably at the time are using a lot of, but that's just, that's from reading different people. I would lean towards something like that. A hundred measure of oil. Now, it's not like um, OPEC. It's not motor oil. Because then it would be much more expensive, of course. And he said, 
unto him, take thy bill, sit down quickly, and write 50. That's not a bad deal. You owe 100, write 50. Verse number 7. Then said he unto another, how much owest thou? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, take thy bill and write fourscore. So there's bushels of wheat and there's gallons of oil. Verse 8 says, the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. That passage, that verse right there makes people kind of wonder about this parable. And we'll look at it deeper Sometimes it's a misunderstood reality and concept that Jesus is teaching through this unjust steward. We'll talk about it. We'll get into what God is really showing us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says there that as he was commended, this unjust steward, for doing wisely, the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Some people that do business principles in this world are wiser than the people that are Christians. So can you learn something from them? Not to cheat and steal and go against God's kingdom work, but rather to take from them principles that would be successful. He says, wisely he did. Verse 9, and I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. I know everybody says the love of money is the root of all evil, so it's not money. He just called mammon unrighteous. So consider in this text what Jesus Christ is saying about the unrighteous mammon. It does bring to context this idea that in itself that money is not really neutral. That has a draw of unrighteousness to it. Now again, we know that the scripture is also true where it says the love of money is the root of all evil, but here we see that mammon, money, is unrighteous. That when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. A great principle about stewardship. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches, the spiritual riches, the things that last for all of eternity? You see, important, important characterization by Jesus Christ in his teaching. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? You can't take care of somebody else's stuff. Well, I will do better when I get it myself for me, will you? It means that when you worked for someone as a worker or a manager of a shop or something and you didn't care very well for the boss's business, you're going to go start your own business. Sorry, there's a really good chance you're going to fail in your own business. I've watched many mechanics over the years do that. Oh, I'm going to fix cars better and cheaper. And then they're out of business after two or three, four years because they were not good stewards over that which was not their own. Verse number 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. Don't we love how the disciples are having a lesson from Jesus Christ? And then guess who shows up? The Pharisees. To deride him, to contend with him, to criticize him, to gnash at him. Verse 15, and he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. And the law, excuse me, verse 16, the law and the prophets were until John, obviously John the Baptist. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Jesus is the fulfillment of it. He's preaching of himself. And they are saying, no, 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 we had to have the laws back. That's the Pharisees' take on things. Verse 17 and 18, And it it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. Why does Jesus put that in? We'll, We'll get there in a little bit. 
here's another reference to the law. Just a simple sidelight, the Pharisees are good about looking at the law as it pertains to everybody else. While Jesus is saying, the Lord knows all about your heart. So, manage failure well. I put up a verse up here from, la- from chapter number 15, and it lends itself to where we're at today. It says up there on the screen, and I know I have the wrong verse address. I realize it in first service. I know all of you will just be so kind to me. It is referencing the prodigal son when he went wayward. It says, And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance and riotous living. I put there something that ties to this. The parable of the prodigal son made it clear that, of course, he, he was a man that was lost in so many ways. And one of the ways that we didn't even talk a whole lot about last week is this. He was a bad steward over all that the father had given him. He wasted it. He was not good with money. He was not good with the possessions that the father gave to him. And we're reminded in chapter 15 again of how there was a theme of being lost, being found, and rejoicing over that, tying it together to salvation, that redemption that God brought through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that incredible salvation. But we see in the prodigal that he was not a good steward of his goods. And he had to repent of this broken, wayward life and come back home. Warren Wearsby has a quote up here that I've used him a few different times. I like how this was put together to tie chapter 15's teaching into chapter 16. In his portrait of the prodigal and the elder brother, Jesus described two opposite philosophies of life. Prior to his repentance, the prodigal wasted his life, but his elder brother only spent his life as a faithful drudge. Just, he really didn't do anything with what he was given. Both attitudes are wrong. For the Christian approach to life is that we should invest our lives for the good of others and the glory of God. This chapter emphasizes that truth. Life is a stewardship and we must use our god-given opportunities faithfully i wonder if this is another one of those doctrinal truths out of discipleship one by one that all of you that have gone through discipleship stuff or you've learned the bible at your churches or this church or you go yeah i know all about stewardship i'm supposed to just uh You know, take everything God's given me, give 10%, and then you'll blow everything else. Is that the way you see your salvation? Is that the way you see the possessions that God is giving you to care for? Is that how you see your children, your grandchildren, your church family? Is that the way that we see stewardship? No, life is a stewardship and we must use our god-given opportunities faithfully nothing more to add to that because that says it all our make home make hope known adventure continues today in chapter number 16 it's parable teaching we'll look at it this way this one will hit home to me i see it for all those that have resolved to be good stewards of the possessions and position god has bestowed upon all of us in this life Think of where you've been put. You say, well, I'm just in terms of references, and, you know, it's no coincidence, and thank you, God, for this, and thank you, God, for that. And we're going beyond that today with what Jesus Christ is saying because we can all fall into a place of being an unjust steward. And what happens when we're unjust stewards? Maybe God says, you can no longer steward things for me. There are many times the Gospels give account of when Jesus directly teaches the disciples, the lesson for the moment, and then, of course, the Pharisees show up. So I'm going to tie that together with this question before we get into this a little bit. What will we glean in our sermon today as his disciples? We've talked about what it means to be a disciple. Or just one of those Pharisees that is critical of other people. I've found that when it comes to stewardship, 
and speaking of it that many people fall into a category of saying, hey, I can see how that person isn't a good steward, but I think I'm doing pretty good with my stewardship. It may be one of those topics that's like one of the top two or three most universally criticized things on the face of the earth, and that's how everybody else drives, but you are a great driver. I think stewardship falls into that one. Everybody else is a terrible steward of God's possessions, but me, on the other hand. Well, that's why, again, I push you back, and I push back on you and say, we need to learn how to manage failure well. Just stare at that for about 30 seconds as I just kind of relate something to it. This guy, some would say, was really just a really bad man, this unjust steward. He would be called in the old days a, uh, really a slacker, a, a scoundrel, a, a thief. He didn't steward what was given to him well, and he's accused, and it gets back to the rich man. This steward is one of those people in Christianity that takes advantage of people, I see. And in this parable, the Lord is saying, hey, this is an example of a man who followed the principles of this world. And in this, the word of God, this accounting, there is parts of it where you go, whoa, wait a minute. What is he being commended for? We'll sort that out. But remember this, the Lord, Jesus Christ, makes the dividing line right down the middle. The way is to love the world and the things of this world, and no man should love, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If you're a Christian, you're to love the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, and that's where we're supposed to live. But Jesus is using a teaching to grab a hold of this principle of, hey, this unjust steward did something right here. Maybe we can glean that when it comes to our stewardship. I'm going to go through, I don't have a lot of, cross references i might mention a verse or two but this time today in our morning message i just want to just just make a comment about each one of these little pieces and parts of scripture in a way that really is kind of like a list about what a steward is like and what a steward needs to do to manage failure so that's the way we're going to go about it our first one's out of verses one and two when called out as a steward you and I are to manage failure with the accountability of your affairs and deals. It says there in verse number one and two, there's a rich man, had a steward. Again, Jesus, right in your face. He was accused unto him. So that means a word got back to him from others that he wasted his goods. Verse two says, he called him and said unto him, how is it that I hear this of thee? Give me an account. Now, here's a simple principle. You know this one. It's the old one finger, three back. When we manage failure well, we have to look at accountability over our, over your. A lot of times I put our up there. This time I put your. So manage failure with the accountability of your, your deals. What deals have you made? Your affairs. What affairs have you got yourself into? Not mine. I'm going to hold you accountable as a steward, pastor, for what you've done. No, this is what the rich man did to the steward. He went after him personally. He didn't gather a bunch of people to bring in some great witness. It came to him. There was an accusation. And so I'm going to deal with you and say, you may not steward anymore. Now give me an account. Here's something that I see is just so very clear, but often forgotten. And it behooves being reminded by Jesus, first of all, and by the Scripture and the way it's laid out. If there's any steward issue, it ought to be between you and the Lord to start with. And then if you, overstu- you are the owner or rich person or the ministry leader or just in your home, you're the father, you're the mother, you're the leader, you're the parent. It is you, between you and someone that you've given care over something. 
It's not going to all the other brothers and sisters. If you gave stewardship to the eldest over something and they didn't do it, deal with it personally. On the other side, talk to that person who is the steward and say, I have given you stewardship. And I want to hear your account of thy stewardship, it says in verse 2. An account of thy stewardship. This is very personal. And it's an accountability that you must have before the Lord Jesus Christ. Stop looking around at everybody else. You know that. I know that. We all know that. But boy, we are so good at checking out someone else's stewardship when the Lord's saying, I want to talk to you about your stewarding, Mark Brown. Well, but, 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 but he did that, and she did that. No, 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 no. I'm coming to you. And when you're called out as a steward, manage this failure with a realization of your situation, excuse me, of your accountability, of your affairs and your dealings. Because a second one leads to this. When ashamed as a steward, and he is ashamed, you manage failure with the realization of your condition and your reputation. Your personal condition, my personal condition, but also your reputation. Because it says in verse number three, the steward says what? What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I can't dig. I can't do anything else. I can't beg. I need to keep this job I have. I cannot lose this stewarding. I'm resolved what to do. I'm going to see if I can win back his favor. I'm sure on the other side of it, from, from just the, the story, from the parable, that look, the owner, the rich man, just wants an accounting of what he's done with his money, what he's done with his business people, what he's done with the reputation that is, of course, upon this man. And you know what happens when an underperson in stewardship to the owner does anything wrong, it reflects on all of the business completely. Did the manager, the steward, dishonestly cheat out all the others that owed him? Did he deduct interest? That would be against Jewish law. Did he have some type of usury imposed upon people? Or was it that, and we'll get into this, or was it there's some other part of it? We'll see it here in a minute. I go back to what it says up on the screen. Manage failure with the realization of your condition and reputation. It is your affairs and deals. It is you and the Lord. And what verse 4 tells me is that this man is serious about making things right. I am resolved what to do. I'm not pushing it down the road. I'm not telling somebody else to take care of things for me. You are supposed to take care of things before the Lord. Just like we're going to have the Lord's Supper. It's between you and the Lord, not someone else. It says that when I am put out of the stewardship, I need to resolve it. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors in verse number five. And he asked a couple questions. Of course, a measure here of oil is anywhere from eight to nine gallons. So we know that there's nearly 900 gallons of, of oil involved. And he says, cut that thing in half. Verse number five, how much owest thou, my Lord? He said, a hundred me measures of oil. Then take thy bill, put it away, sit down quickly and write 50. Give me what I need for 50%. He says in verse number seven about the bushels, the hundred measures of wheat, that a measure of wheat would be Simply put, maybe 10, 8 to 10 bushels, be 1,000 or over 1,000 bushels. He said, hey, take 20% off the top, write four score. He is finding a way to negotiate things. He's finding a way to work through this all. He's doing what he needs to do because the realization of his condition, his reputation is completely wrong. It's going to have a reflect on the, reflection on the owner. How many of you have done bad business with people as Christians? How many of us have looked at things and gone, okay, I'm going to make this right. I'm going to go steal something from somebody because that's what it's teaching. No, his commission that he used to get on the business, and that's really what is at the core of this, the owner allows him to make money off of the business people that they're doing business with. So they can make some money. 
He's saying, boy, I better make this right. Forget about my commission. Forget about my overcharging. Hey, just write this much. Just write that much. I just need to get some, <laughs> some cash flow and some product back to the owner, the rich man, and somehow maybe I can survive through this. You see, when you're ashamed, and I'm ashamed, and we're ashamed as stewards, we must manage failure with the realization that our reputation has been hurt. And our condition and where we're at has eroded and deteriorated. As he says in here, and he's looking at this going, hey, verse 4 is interesting. As you know, it says, when I put out the, of the, if I'm put out of the, when I'm put out of the stewardship, that may receive me into their houses. Who? <laughs> the person with the oil. The person with the, <laughs> with the bushels of wheat. I want, to, I want to make sure I got a job. I'm covering myself, so I'll make, a, I'll make a deal with the people that I used to get an awful lot of profit from just so I can have this stewardship or maybe even a home. It's really important to understand that when we're called out as stewards, when we're call, call, ashamed as stewards, that we need to make things right. We need to manage that failure. The third one, when praised as a steward. We won't spend a lot of time on this, but let me make it really clear He's commended and praised, and this should point to where we need to manage failure with the wisdom of our surroundings and purpose. What do you mean? The surroundings is the world's way of doing business. The Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. He gave those people a break to make both sides, both sides, end up being okay in it all because he's made a business decision in the world's system of doing things this is commended it's not hey keep on cheating the people and steal from them no jesus's parable is saying hey you are commended for taking a business principle in the world and making it work for the kingdom of god and his righteousness for the gospel of the lord jesus christ has anybody heard of adp sports park at all ADP Sports, maybe. We're going to celebrate the 20th anniversary in a couple weeks. Is that not in where we live in the world's culture one of their things? Sports. It's a culture of life. It's a philosophy of life. It's a way of life for some people. If they do not have their kids get their injection of sports every single week, ah! But that's the world's way of doing life. So what do we do? Well, there's some wisdom from the world in applying that. Here we look at this and go, here's your wisdom. From the surroundings, but we're going to do it for the kingdom of God. We're going to do it for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to do it for relationships to give the message of who Jesus Christ is. Demonstrate the love of Christ through sports in our community. Purpose. That's the purpose. The surroundings is the world system and the way they are. So we don't say, oh, I want to be like the world system. No, I want to operate within it and take that business principle and have God be honored and glorified. Because it says in verse number 9 something quite interesting. And I mentioned it a little bit in reading through it. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. He's speaking to his disciples, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. You're going to have eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. That unrighteous stuff that's going to be dealt with, you operate through it, past it, within it, and you say, hey, make yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Don't love it to be depth in depth and evil. Make friends with it to allow God's glory to operate the right way. Why don't you just do all of that sports stuff for free? No, people pay $60, $80, half price for the second child. Why? Because the Unrighteous mammon needs to be used in a proper way to get the gospel out. That's a safe example, but there's so many like that. That's what the Lord is teaching us. Not to say, oh, we need to make more money. We're going to charge $150 per kid. 
<laughs> we'll be so rich out there, we're going to put a dome on top of the sports park. Oh, I've dreamt of such things. First, we must put turf in to avoid getting through a drought where it's going to be 218 degrees today for co-ed softball. It's all right. When ashamed as a steward, manage failure with a realization, uh, excuse me, of your condition and reputation. Manage failure when you're praised as a steward of the wisdom in your surroundings. Here's a couple more. When stirred as a steward, manage failure with the faithfulness of your resources and your time. Again, here's simple, straightforward stuff. Verse 10 says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful in much. There's where the faithfulness comes. When you're stirred up as a steward, gosh, I got this idea. Well, then be faithful with it. Be faithful with the least, and maybe he will give you much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Remember the principle of stewardship that the Lord teaches throughout his earthly ministry. If therefore, verse number 11, ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? I made a comment on that earlier. When you're stirred, stirred as a steward, you should say, okay, I'm going to manage the failure of me being twisted up, wanting to really do some great things, some great ideas, failing and making a mess out of things. So I wasn't faithful for little. God, would you please give me another chance? God gives us another chance. We make it right. We repent from the, of the way that we did this. Say, okay, God, I need to be more faithful with my resources, with your resources. We need to be, as a church, faithful with the resources and faithful with time. People only have so much time to give. And we know it to be true because the other side of it is, hey, there's the spiritual versus the material. There's always that. It's always one or the other. It's, okay, I can lean into the spiritual stuff. It says in verse number 12, if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? You say, well, just apply that spiritually. Hey, why is it that more people don't come to know the Lord? Well, maybe the size of the church or the body of Christ or the, the work in the kingdom, the gospel. Why isn't there more people? Well, when you're stirred as a steward, you have to be faithful and realize with what little that I have, I need to be really, really faithful with it, saying, God, give us more. Maybe it relates to people coming to know Christ. Maybe it comes to a ministry that grows and grows from 50 children in soccer to 350 over the course of 20 years. Maybe it is, thank you God for that. We're stirred as stewards, but we have to be faithful with the little, and we have to be faithful with our resources. I often say that God's greatest resource, resource is God's people. You and I are his resource, and it's not just any amount of people it's god's people who are stewards of god's work and god's position and god's monetary gifts as well as talents spiritual gifts things like that that's four of them let me run out these last two for time measures but they still just fit with the passage of scripture i'm going to read verse 13 and then i'm going to put it into the next one no servant can serve two masters. You've heard this before. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. We know back in Matthew's gospel, we know about the Sermon on the Mount. It is spoken there by Jesus Christ. Lay up not for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Matthew chapter number 6, verses 19 down through 22, 23. When mocked as a steward by the Pharisees for doing the things that you're doing in and of the Lord, and you're serving the Lord as your master, what do we do? These Pharisees mocked the steward of all stewards, the Lord Jesus Christ. When mocked as a steward, manage failure with the construct of your heart and standards. The construct. What has God been building in you? The construction of your heart. The construction of your standards in life. 
These Pharisees had standards, though they were covetous, though they were unrighteous, though they loved their money and loved their law and wanted to judge everybody on the outside, though their insides were as dead man's bones. It says in verse 14, the Pharisees also, when they were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And Jesus answers that with verse 15. Verse 15 is huge. We know that. Manage failure with the construct of your heart and the standards by which you have grown as a Christian. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of the Lord. Oh, I got credit for a lot of things. and I'm so glad that people patted me on the back. God knows the hearts for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. You did it for your own gain. This unjust steward, he did things to make himself look good, but then it got back to the rich man, the owner, <laughs> that he had a bad reputation. He was being accused of doing business wrong. And so now, to make this account right, and make an accounting of his fares and his deals and all that he did, he went back and he said, hey, write 50. Hey, write four score. Hey, I need to make things right, even if I'm no longer going to be the steward of this rich man that I have been working for all these years. Well, now you fast forward and you get the Pharisees to show up and say, ah, it's fine. If people don't like it, too bad. Well, that's if this world system is your steward. Excuse me your Lord and your stewarding to the Lord's system, we are to operate within the business of how that person that operates as the children of this world can be, we, we can learn from them and be a little wiser as the children of light so that people can come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. That's our ultimate deal, not to make more money. Oh, I'm here to make more money, and for what? There's nothing wrong with being a huge success financially, but for what? The Pharisees, they mocked the steward of all stewards in the Lord Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd, and he put it right back on them and said, hey, you've got a problem with your covetousness, and you have a problem with your hearts. Lastly, I see something that, of course, has to happen for all of us. When finished as a steward, you manage failure with the importance of your word and worship. This pushes us all to realize that yes, the construct of our heart, our standards, but it comes back to the word of God. And when you are finished and you want to hear from the Lord, well done, thou good and faithful servant, when you're finished stewarding, maybe you'll live till 80, but when you hit 70-ish, you'll be debilitated and you can no longer care for things. Maybe you're 72, 73, your physical health gets bad, and so you can no longer steward. So here it is, when finished as a steward, maybe even at a younger age, something gets in the way of your ability to steward the affairs that God had given you, and now you've got to pull out. I can't serve because I've gone through a marriage problem. I can't serve because my children are in a rough place. Well, when you're finished stewarding that which you stewarded before, maybe you can just steward that which God has still given you the opportunity and ability to do. Steward your relationship with him in the word and in your worship. It comes back to that every time, doesn't it? That's what this message is truly about. When finished as a steward, manage failure with the importance of your word and worship. It should be that when you consider 16 out of 29 parables again are about stewarding God's resources. And that money is talked about by the Lord in his gospels and other people issues with money. And you think, that must be really important. Yes, yes. But how we view it and how we go about it has so much to do with stewardship. The eight bags of gold that were distributed in Matthew 25. My grandson loves that story. I don't know why other than he just loves the idea of the master saying, you were, you were foolish, the one with the one bat of gold that just buried it in the ground. You and I, we have been given talents We've been giving riches. We've given spiritual gifts. 
we've been given time and resources, what will we do with it? How will we care for it? When you're finished as a steward, manage failure. When you're mocked as a steward, manage failure. When you're stirred as a steward, manage failure. When you and I are praised maybe for our stewardship, manage failure. When we're called out by our Lord, manage failure well. It says up on the screen in light of our Lord's Supper time, as we enter into the Lord's Supper, let us be mindful of how we steward Back to that verse, verse 15. Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. You put on a show. But God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Why don't you stand and bow your heads for a word of prayer as we enter into the Lord's Supper time and partake and do business with the Lord. Our Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for being our owner of our salvation in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your people that you have saved. We are the sons of God. Behold what manner of love the Father is bestowed. Thank you. May we, right now, as a community, as a local church, as the body of Christ, really zero in on what you did for us, Father, when you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and how the salvation that we have in Christ is something we need to steward a lot better than often that we do. May we finish as a steward with our relationship with you in communion and worship and the word as strongly as we started. Thank you for this time now in the word. Thank you for this time now in communion. I pray you be honored and glorified. Receive the glory as we go into the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.